Do you celebrate Easter? Um, yeah, a little bit. Do you celebrate Easter? No. Do I celebrate Easter? No. Do you celebrate Easter? Yes, I do. What's so important about Easter? What's it all about? I believe it's because the day of Jesus was born, or it has to do with God. Why do you celebrate Easter? Uh, it's a fun family time. Is there any significance to why we recognize it as a holiday? I don't recognize it as a holiday due to my religious beliefs. Do you celebrate Easter? Mm, not really. I just know that you pick up Easter eggs on Easter. Why do you celebrate Easter? Because uh, my parents did. What do you think the significance of Easter is? What's it all about? Uh, it's about uh, Christ. Uh, the Christ of... Uh... Why do you celebrate Easter? Because that's how I grew up. What's it all about? I don't know. What's the significance of Easter? Um, I really don't know. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah. You know, that's the historical meaning of the holiday. Oh, really? That's it. Learn something new every day, don't you? You believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Yes. Do you know that's the significance of the holiday? I do now. I know. Most people celebrate it about Jesus, but I'm not religious, so. They say Jesus rose from the dead, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's, uh... Something of Jesus, I don't know. Well, I think it has something to do with, like, God, or I don't know. I don't really know that much, but... Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Is that... I really don't know what I believe. Huh. Well, this kind of confusion that we see in our culture today is reminiscent of an incident that the Bible talks about when the Apostle Paul... It's in Acts 17, was in the city of Athens in Greece, and he found him thoroughly confused. The only difference between Acts 17 and Paul in, in, in Athens and our culture is that we had 2,000 years of Christian history. Paul experienced in Athens in Acts 17 was before Christianity even arrived in Europe. But today, 2,000 years later, Western civilization, Western culture is entering into a post-Christian era. In fact, some would probably call it anti-Christian era. And when you think in this weekend, in the city of London, the city that gave us John Wesley and some of the great reformers, have ditched the celebration of Easter and in, in favor of celebrating Ramadan. All the decoration in the city of London this weekend is about Ramadan. Now, please hear me right on this one. The sad part is this. Without the Christian faith, society will plunge into a dark ages. The Christian faith always bring about civilization. Listen to me, I was born in Africa. And I'm telling you what I'm telling you is because it's the absolute truth. Without the Christian faith, lawlessness, chaos, and anarchy will sit in. Turn with me if you haven't already to Acts chapter 17. The apostle Paul finds himself in the city of Athens all alone. And at this point of history, Greece has passed its peak. Uh, it, it, it was on the decline, just like our Western civilization today. Uh, the false religions were rampant throughout uh, the Greek culture. Again, in this backdrop, we find the Apostle Paul finding himself alone in this declining culture, in this declining civilization. And he walks around Athens and he becomes more and more distressed uh, over the ignorance of the populace of the one true God. But soon he realizes that these folks, like people in our culture today, <laughs> uh, they do not heed, hear and heed the truth, and that's what they needed. They needed to hear the truth and need to heed the truth. They needed to hear and heed the truth about Christ as the only way for salvation. They needed to hear and heed God's revelation of himself in one person and one person only, and his name is Jesus. And because of that, 
the last thing the, these Athenians needed, the last thing is another philosopher. They were up to the eyeballs with philosophers. Uh, the last thing they needed is another fangled uh, teaching about something new. They were knee deep in false teaching. Uh, the last thing they needed is a new religion. Uh, they were swimming in all sorts of false religions. What they desperately needed is what our culture needs today desperately, and that is namely the need to know the truth about the only one who can save them. Amen. The only one, the only one true God who revealed himself fully and completely in the person of Jesus Christ, his son. They needed to know the res that he was resurrected from the death, never to die again. So he stands on that hill known as Mars Hill. I stood on that hill a couple of times. It's right across from the Acropolis. It's a, an amazing feeling when you stand there knowing what the Apostle Paul went through. Um, and after he got their attention, uh, he began to tell them about the God of heaven and earth, uh, the God who rose from the dead after three days of being buried, the God who their only hope for escaping the judgment that is coming upon the world. Now, some of them called him babbling idiots. Well, that's not unusual because if today, if you would stand on a university campus anywhere and you declare that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no salvation without him, you will be hounded out of that place. They will call you more than just babbling idiot. They will call you all sorts of, they will hound you. The Greeks, in their utter confusion, uh, about, in, in, in their desire to be tolerant, oh, that's a big word, they, in their desire for tolerance, they tolerated all kinds of false gods and philosophies, but they missed out on the one true God. Paul's message is very simple, really simple, and the problem is they stumbled over its simplicity. What is it? That the resurrection of Jesus is a proof that he is the only one true God who became man, and then he is coming back to be the judge of the world. Now, if you want to follow with me, please turn to Acts 17. I don't want you to think I'm making this stuff up. <laughs> and, and just check me out on, on my facts right here, because I'm only telling you what God's Word is saying. And if you don't have a Bible with you, grab one in front of you in the pew, page 1724. Page 1724. Acts 17. Not unlike our culture, the Athenians have turned the tolerance into careless indifference. Uh, they have turned compassion into compromise. Uh, they have turned their need for the one true God into some sort of a mishmash of accepting all kinds of false gods and false religions. Verse 22, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. And probably somebody here or watching around the world would say, Michael, what's wrong with that? Isn't it good that they're religious? No, it is not. Because religion kills, but Jesus gives life. <laughs> Today there are so many people who are religious. They call themselves spiritual. And when you start digging in what they mean by spiritual, you discover there's just a, a bit of a, a new age mysticism. <laughs> when I tell people that I am not religious, particularly my non-believing friends and neighbors, Amen. when I tell them that I'm not a religious person uh, or I abhor religion, I can't stand religion, right. I would give anything for you to see the looks on their faces. One lady said, but you're the man of the cloth. I said, I don't know about cloth. The only cloth I have is my suit. <laughs> Listen, to be sure, to be sure, everyone in the world is religious. Did you know that? 
everyone is religious because everyone worship something or someone. Some people worship self, some people worship money, some people worship sports, some people worship nature. Uh, they're all like the Athenians of old. In Paul's day, they worship something. And Paul said, as I look around, I saw object of your worship. These are statues that have erected in that Mars Hill area in the, near the Acropolis. Uh, the, he looked at all these statues and see all the names on these statues. And then he said, I noticed that just to play it safe, you've decided that there must be a God somewhere I, that you don't know about. There must be a God somewhere we, we never heard of. And in order to play it safe so he doesn't punish you or doesn't judge you out of fear of that God, you have erected a statue calling it to the unknown God. They're covering all their bases. They're covering all their bases. You're thinking that this is a new thing. It's not. I had a, a very dear Jewish friend. I spent a lot of time with him. In fact, many times we're on the treadmill next to each other. He has moved to Florida since then. But, and I, he calls himself an agnostic. He said, there must be a God somewhere, that's fine. I just don't know if there's a God, there's no God, I don't know. And I would share Christ with him and I will share history with him. I share even scientific arguments with him. And until one day, he said to me, he said, I tell you what, I think you're gonna be very happy to know that in my car, I have a rosary that was blessed by Pope John Paul II. And I said, whatever his name, I'm not going to tell his name. I said, but he told me you're agnostic. He said, shh, every little bit helps. Every little bit helps. Every little bit helps is, was the motto of these Athenians that Paul was confronting 2,000 years ago. They were so worried that there's some sort of a God somewhere that they have not heard about and they're concerned that he might be a vicious God who would judge them or who would kill them. So they just erected a statue and they worshiped this unknown God. Uh, they didn't want to offend him in case he's one of those bad gods. In fact, it was said of Greece of old that they had more gods than men. <laughs> Think about that. They were forever inventing new gods. They're forever coming up with new gods. In the 21st century, listen to me about beloved friends, in the 21st century, we have many who are like the Epicureans of old. They believe that pleasure is what life is all about. We have many others who are like the Stoics of old. They believe in self-sufficiency. And that is represented in the Victus poem. I am the master of my fate and I'm the captain of my soul. And that's precisely why Paul's message in Acts 17 on Mars Hill, it is absolutely the most needed message in our culture today. Amen. It is needed for our generation. What was that message? Your eternal life depends on your surrender to the resurrected Jesus. Amen. Your eternal future rests on the belief and the surrender to the resurrected Jesus. Whatever religion, whatever object of worship, whatever philosophy you are pursuing, it will lead you to ruins, not only in this life, but for all of eternity. Amen. Only the resurrected, glorified, and soon coming back judge Jesus can bless you both in this life and for all of eternity. Amen. Oh, my beloved friends, <laughs> this is the only Easter message that is worthy of your consideration. Amen. That is the only Easter message that is worthy of accepting. Look with me again. Word of God, Acts 17, beginning at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it Oops, they never heard of him. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, 
He does not live in shrine made by men, nor he is served by human hands as though he needed them or needed anything, since he himself gives all people. He gives how many people? Life and breath and everything they have. He gives everything, whether they know it or not, whether they believe it or not. He is the God of power and might. He is the God of glory. He's the God who revealed himself to Israel. Now he's revealing himself to the world. The times of ignorance. Look at the verse, this verse with me, please. The times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent. You say, why? I'm glad you asked. It's a good question. Ask why. Because he set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he appointed. And by this, he assured us by raising him from the dead. Here's the message in all of its simplicity. Up to this point in your life, up to this point before you're hearing the message of the resurrected Christ, the past, whether you knew Jesus or not, in the past, whether you believed in Jesus or not, in the past, whether you knew that Jesus is the only way to heaven and to the Father or not, in the past, whether you believed in the resurrection or not, in the past, whether you comprehended that he is the way, the truth, and the life or not, in the past, ignorance or not, even if you did not know, it doesn't matter. That time God is overlooked. That time God is, is covered. That time God is ready to redeem. That time God is ready to save. That time God is ready to forgive. But now, as of this day, when you've heard the message of the resurrected Jesus, when you heard the good news of the gospel, from now on, you know that there's only one option. If you want to save your soul, repent of your sin, repent of your unbelief, repent of your indifference, repent of your ignoring God's message to you that's been speaking to you in a variety of ways for so long. Repent of your hesitancy to commit your life to him and come to him that he may bless you out of your socks. Now, that's a rough translation, but you get the meaning. <laughs> As of this Easter Sunday, and going forward in your life, turn around from your dark and dreary road on which you've been traveling. Turn around from pursuing false philosophies. Turn around while you can. Turn around before it's too late. Turn around and receive God's mercy while it is found. Turn around and experience the grace of God while it is possible. For the time is coming where the one resurrected Jesus who wants to be your savior and your friend now will be your judge. Amen. The time is coming when everyone who have rejected him as savior and a friend and a redeemer will have to stand before the bench and face him as judge. Amen. Why? Good question. Why? Why can't I just believe whatever I want to believe and get away with it? Why, why can't I just believe that if I'm a good person, God will have no choice but to accept me? Why can't I just uh, uh, think I can do my best and then God will have to accept me? First of all, if you're listening to me, say amen. amen. You and I don't make the rules. Right. All right? Amen. We don't make the rules. If you have a kid in school, goes up to the headmaster, we say, I don't like this idea of coming to school at 8.30 in the morning. I want to come at 10.30 in the morning. I want to sleep in. We know what happens. Uh, he gets out of school. We don't make the rules. God makes the rules. And God said in his word that there is no one, not one other than Jesus, who's good. That's right. 
Not one. None of us. Not this pastor. Nobody. Nobody. That we're all born with our backs to God. That we're all born to say no to God. And so God made a way to remedy the situation. (laughs) Only one way. He didn't say, well, here's a variety of ways. Choose your way. No, no, no. There is one way and only one way. His son who coexisted with him in the Holy Trinity. The son, the second member of the Holy Trinity, left heaven because he loved us enough, came from heaven to earth as the only perfect person ever, ever lived, the only sinless person ever, ever lived so that he can redeem repentant sinners like me. There is one Savior, and that is why he rose from the dead. Jesus raised a lot of people from the dead, at least three we know in the Gospels. They all died again. But Jesus rose from the dead never to die again. He is now reigning and ruling on the rim of the universe. And soon he's coming back. And it may be sooner than we think. You look at the news and you see all the signs that he gave us in Matthew 24 and 25. All the signs are here now. On the cross, Jesus died to redeem everyone, everyone who would come to him in faith, believing in him, repenting of their sins. Then he rose again to assure every one of his believers of their own resurrection in heaven. My friend, make no mistake about it. And I've been around for a long time. All the so-called founders of other religions, they're all dead and in their tombs. Only Jesus Christ's tomb is empty. Every time I go, every time I go to the Holy Land, I walk around the two places that tug on my heart. Caiaphas' basement, and I've mentioned that on Good Friday. Caiaphas' basement where Jesus spent the last night before the cross and the empty tomb. And the tomb's still empty. And the tomb's still empty. And only Jesus' empty tomb qualifies him to be our judge. And because of that empty tomb, not only that he is set apart, as we sang, he has no equal, he has no rival, and nobody even come close. Not only sets him apart, but he commands everyone everywhere to repent and turn to him. Amen. Don't miss this. Please don't miss this. Don't miss this. He said, God commands everyone everywhere. He didn't say, well, God just uh, requests. <laughs> or oh, the God suggests. Oh, God really recommends that everyone. No, 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 no. Why? Because his resurrection power qualified him to be the only judge of the universe. Because of his resurrection power, he's the only one who has the authority to command. So you can either thankfully accept the gift of forgiveness of sin and eternal life as I've done 60 years and three weeks ago. Or you can regretfully reject the offer and face the consequences. (laughs) The choice is yours. The choice is yours. You know, sometimes all illustrations are imperfect, but we often, history, and if you read history and you love history like I do, you see the history littered with situations where people have been forewarned about something and they ignored it. And I'm talking about things not as significant, as important as where you spend eternity. Just simple things. For example, I so vividly remember the story I read 
that back in 1938, 1938, that's a true story, on September of 1938, Mr. John Martin of Long Island, New York, ordered a barometer in the mail. He wanted a barometer. Since he was a boy, he wanted a barometer. He wanted to own a barometer. And so now that he has a job and he earns money, he goes and order the barometer. And so in the morning, the barometer came in the mail. He literally tore the box open and he was so excited to check that barometer that he always wanted. But to his deep disappointment, the barometer needle was stuck on the section that says hurricane. It stuck. And so he did what every respectable man does with a gadget that he doesn't know how to operate. I'm one. He shook it. He banged on it. And the needle wouldn't budge to no avail. So he sat down that night and he wrote a very nasty letter to the manufacturer. And he complained bitterly of that faulty barometer that he spent money on. And the next morning as he was going from Long Island to Manhattan where he was working, he took that letter and he mailed it, put it in the mail to the manufacturer. That evening, that same evening where he mailed the letter in the morning, (laughs) he returned home to Long Island to find his house totally destroyed. If you guessed it, by a hurricane. The barometer needle was not stuck. The manufacturer did not make an error. The instrument was not faulty. The barometer was doing its job. It was Mr. John Martin who refused to heed the warning. Oh, beloved, heed the warning. Heed the warning. None of us can guarantee one day of life. My friends, hear me right on this one. This is the message and the burden of my heart for the last 52 years and I've taken it all over the world. I have no other message. Some of you here in this beautiful sanctuary, many of you are watching around the world. We, we, we have people watching literally in, in dozens and dozens of countries live. There's a wonderful gentleman in a room there and he's translating, he's speaking over me in Arabic. So the whole kingdom sat, which God gave us since, 19, uh, since uh, 2009, millions of homes can hear this message. So some of you, whether you're here or, or, or watching around the world, are angry with me right now. Oh, I get a lot of angry messages. I get a lot of angry. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. We pray for you when we get these angry letters and saying, Jesus is only a prophet. He's only a prophet. Well, listen carefully, please. You might be angry with me right now. And you'll be saying to me, I don't like this business of someone commanding me. I don't like this business that there's only one way to God the Father and to heaven. I don't like this business that I have to accept Jesus as my only Savior and Lord of my life to be saved. Others may be totally indifferent. And they're saying, yeah, ho hum, so Jesus rose from the dead, so what? Totally indifferent. You don't care if this is your last warning or not. You don't care if God speaking to you and trying to get your attention or not. You don't care about the resurrection or the judgment of God that is coming. Please, 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 I plead with you. Do not blame the manufacturer. Do not blame the warning that your creator and your maker and your redeemer is giving you. Don't just shrug and say, who cares? Eternity is a very, very, very long time. Trust your creator. Trust your maker. Trust in the one who loved you enough to die on the cross for you. But then there may be others here 
or watching again around the world. At the sound of my voice, who are living a stressed out life, who are experiencing emotional depression and don't know how to get out of it. There are some probably questioning the very meaning of life. I have done it and I nearly took it. But thank God, thank God. Amen. he spared me. Yes. Amen. Amen. Today, I'll tell you on the authority of God's word that today, the one who rose from the dead can meet you at your very point of need. He knows your need and he wants to meet that need. Only Jesus can do that. Church cannot, pastors cannot, no one can. Only Jesus can. And he can do that today, here and now, today, and give you meaning in your meaningless life. I want to tell you something for those visitors here. I know Easter always brings visitors, and I'm so grateful to the Lord for bringing you here. You are welcome. We love it when we have visitors, and I'm so glad you're here. So glad you're here. You might have come here because grandma asked you to come or somebody asked you to come. Family friend brought you. That's wonderful because you may not have known this, but God has an appointment with you today. But if you don't know this church, let me tell you a thing about or two about this church that I have known for 37 years since I started with 28 people. In this church, we have no small prints. Are you with me? Yes. You know how the advertisement, give you all the stuff, you, and then it's little tiny small prints, but only if you have qualified and, and you have to come there in the middle of the night on Tuesday, every second Tuesday. Uh, no small prints in this church. We have no small prints. We have nothing to advertise. We have nothing to sell. So I'm not saying that the moment you commit your life to Christ, that all of your problems are gonna be over. That would not be true to the Word of God. As a matter of fact, I can tell you in 1964, when I committed my life to Christ, my problems started. But here's what I promise you on the authority of God's word, that the power of the one who rose from the dead, when you surrender to him, he will sustain you. He will lift you up above the difficulties of circumstances. He will elevate your vision above all of the challenges of life. He will help you to keep your eyes on your eternal home. I know I speak for many people around the world that I've traveled and preached to and ministered to and served, and, around, and I speak for many in this church. For those of us who've experienced life without Christ, and then now we're experiencing life with Christ, hands down, we would never want to go back. Never want to go back. The time of ignorance God has overlooked. But now he commands everyone, everywhere, to repent. Question, why does he command us? Oh, because he loves us enough not to leave us in a life of purposelessness. You know, everywhere in the media, and I'm always fascinated by that, being trained as a cultural anthropologist and, and in social media as well. And, you know, all the ad- people advertising, people t- asking you, oh, tell us your opinion. Yeah. Give us your opinion. What do you think? Um, they don't give a flip about your opinion, by the way. Just, just to know that I sat in these rooms when these matters were discussed. They don't give a flip about your opinion. They just want to sell you a product. 
But thank God he's not selling you anything. He's not selling you anything. And he's not interested in your opinion. Man, that was disappointing when I discovered that. Because I always want to give God some ideas, some help. Beloved, he made us. And therefore, he knows what's best for us far better than we think we know what's best for us. I want to tell you this as I conclude. Now, I pray to God that if the Holy Spirit's spoken to you, wherever you are, that you would not leave your seat today without coming to Christ, receiving him as Savior and Lord, and then tell somebody about it. Come and tell us about it. Many of you have seen the Titanic movie, the old one, uh, the newer one, and, and many, I assume, everybody probably at the sound of my voice know about the Titanic. But what probably don't know is that after the sinking of the Titanic, the families and the friends of the passengers who were on that terrible ship, the loved ones, they all flocked to the head office of the company that owned the Titanic. It was White Star Line in Liverpool, England. They came from all over. And they filled the streets in front of the head office there. They filled not just the street in the front, but streets on the side, everywhere. Anyone can find a place to stand. They were happy to come. I just want to know if the loved ones made it or they've drowned in the Atlantic. The company officials put two signs on each side of the door of their head office. One sign read, the names of those who are known to be saved. And on the other side, it says, the names of those who have perished. Two categories, two signs, no third. Every now and then, one of the company officials would come with a cardboard with a name of a person on it. And he would hold that cardboard high so everybody can read it, everybody can see it. And they said that every time a person comes out with that name on a cardboard, you've experienced, even though there were masses of people, deathly silence. Deathly signs. People literally were holding their breath to see on which side the name is going to hang. Is it among those who are saved or those who perished? Two categories. No third. Oh, my beloved friend, in far greater way, far greater way, far more eternal way, on the day of judgment, there are going to be two signs, two categories of people. The saved and the lost. No third. Which side will you name be on? Which side will you name be on? Which side will you name be on? I pray to God everyone at the sound of my voice would say, I'm among the saved. But if you're not, that's okay. If you're not sure, we're going to have a great opportunity now to make absolutely sure. Would you pray with me, please? If you say, Michael, I've been a church person for all these years, but really, I'm not sure what my way, my name. I'm not certain. All you need to do is stand up where you are. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or anything. Just stand up where you are. If the Holy Spirit spoke to you and said, this is your day. This is your day in which you can be absolutely sure that your name is written in a book of life among the saved. Just stand up for you where you are. It's between you and heaven, between you and God. God is the one who's watching. God is the one who will be your judge, not this church or me or anybody else. Amen. Lord Jesus, 
If you don't want to stand up, you can raise your hand. That's fine. Whatever, something you need to do for God and for heaven to witness that you have made that on Easter Sunday. Thank you. I can see you in the balcony. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to prolong this, but I'll give you one more chance. If the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, this may be your last and final warning. You can either raise your hand or stand up. Don't be ashamed of Christ. He said, those who are ashamed of me in the last day, I'll be ashamed of them before my Father. I am not ashamed of Him anymore. I used to be. Father God, I praise You for those who want to see their names written in the book of life. And my beloved friends, you can say this in the privacy of your own thoughts. Say it with me. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for dying for me on the cross and rising again. I thank you for allowing me to heed this warning and to ensure that my name is written among the saved. Help me to walk with you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All of God's people said amen. amen. Would you stand up, please?